Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first um, early 10.30, our first morning live interview as part of the If You Were an Engineer competition for this year. We know that many of you are already well underway with this project in school, and that's why we bring you these live interviews. And this morning, we've got a great guest joining us in Kiara McGrath, who has come along to share about her work and what she does looking at the earth from space and understanding what impact we're having. So I'm hoping, Kiara, that I've set everything up so you should be able to turn on your camera and excellent. Good morning. Hi, how are you? I'm not too bad, thank you. I'm not too bad. Um, thank you to everyone who's joining us. I can see there are more coming along um, as we are beginning. Um, but uh, without further ado, I shall hand over to you because what I have to say is not very interesting. And I know from your presentation that what you have to say is very, very interesting. So do you want me to share the presentation or would you like, are you all right screen sharing from yours? Yeah, I'll share it from my end and hopefully it'll all work. But you can shout at me if it goes horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> Perfect. And if you've got any questions for Kiara as we're going through, please pop them into the Q&A or into the chat. I will try and monitor both and work through those. Um, once Kiara has gone through her presentation, I will then start asking those questions as they've come in. So there we go, Kiara, it's uh, all yours. So are you seeing my my? My, well, my it's, face a second time, I suppose. <laughs> it's all coming up and looking perfect. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for coming along this morning, bright and early. Um, it is so exciting to be here and talk to you um, about my work and about what I do. So um, as was said, my name is Kira. I am a lecturer in aerospace systems at the University of Manchester. So what that means is that I do research and I teach students. Um, but my background and the work that I actually do and the classes that I teach are all about engineering. So I trained as an engineer and I'm now helping to teach the next generation of engineers as well. Um, and in particular, the engineering that I do is about spacecraft. So how we design and build spacecraft and how we send them into space. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you about today is about how we can use space to make the world a better place. So quickly, a little bit of background about me. So I actually grew up in Ireland, in Dublin. Uh, that's where I went to school. Um, and I studied uh, chemistry and physics for my final exams because I really liked science. I also studied music, um, but I actually quit that just before the exam because I realized that I could neither sing nor play the piano. So that would have gone really badly. Um, but I thought it was really fun to do alongside all the science and maths that I was doing. And when I finished school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I thought maybe I'd be a scientist because I really enjoyed science. But it was actually my dad who encouraged me to consider engineering. And he told me that engineers get to use maths and science to create new technologies that can make the world a better place and make people's lives better. And I thought that sounded really exciting. So I came over to the UK then. Uh, I went to the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow in Scotland, and I studied engineering there. Um, and I was really lucky during my degree that I, through my student projects at university, got to work on a spacecraft. Uh, the spacecraft was called U-Cube One, and it was Scotland's very first spacecraft. So this was an absolute dream come true as a student to be able to do that. Um, I then went on to have a very exciting career. So rather than talking all about that, I just thought I'd quickly sum it up, which is that I have got to uh, live and work in five countries. I've studied and worked at four universities. I've worked on three different spacecraft. Two of those have now been launched into space. One of them's still being tested. Um, and one of those spacecraft actually has my name engraved on the side of it. So that is a picture of the solar panel from U-Cube 1, which was that first Scottish spacecraft. And you can see my name printed there right in the middle. Um, and I've had a pretty exciting career, but I still think that that is the coolest thing that has ever happened to me, to know that there's a spacecraft up above us with my name on the side of it. So I think that'll be a tough one to top. But enough about me. 
I want to talk about space. So what I want to ask you to do is to take a second and just think, when I say the word space to you, what do you think of? So maybe turn to the person next to you, maybe have a little chat. I'll just give you a couple of seconds. What do you think of when I say space? Okay, hopefully you've had a little think, maybe you've shared some ideas with the people next to you. I think there's lots of different things that we think of when we think of space. Maybe some of these were one of the ones that you came up with. So lots of people think about stars or galaxies. Um, we think about planets, that's Saturn, that's my favorite planet because I think the rings are beautiful. Um, maybe you thought about astronauts, maybe visiting the moon, you know, doing moonwalks or maybe aliens trying to think, is there life out there or is it just us? One of the really big questions. And these are the kinds of things lots of people think of when we think of space. But actually, when I think of space, I think of something quite different. So what I think about is I think about all the satellites that we have in orbit around our Earth that are looking down at us and collecting data to help us in our lives. So they're doing all sorts of things uh, from helping us to predict the weather so that we know whether we need to bring a coat today. Um, generally a good bet in the UK, I know, but you know, it's always nice to know when we can expect some sunshine. Um, they're also doing things like looking at our rainforests so that we can see how well our rainforests are growing, whether there's problems with deforestation um, and, and helping us to protect those really important habitats. And they can also see parts of the world that are really hard to visit. So things like the North Pole and the South Pole, the polar ice caps, is very hard to go there as a person to go and actually see what's happening. And satellites can help us take images and see what's happening there, see how the animals there are living and see how those ice caps are changing as we see climate change progressing. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you really quickly about two examples of how we use space to help people here on Earth that I don't think most people know about, and I think they're pretty exciting. So the first one is pirates. I expect most people will not think that you can fight pirates from space, but they would be wrong. So what you might not know is that every ship that heads out to sea has a little beacon on board. And that beacon sends a signal back to people on the shore to tell them where that boat is and what it's doing. And that's really helpful because it means we can keep track of all these ships and know that they're safe and, you know, that something hasn't gone wrong. But if the ships are far away from the shore, so for example, if you were traveling from the UK all the way over to America, you would have to go right across the Atlantic Ocean. And when the ships are far away from the shore, we can't hear that signal back on the land. It's just too far away. So what we do is we use spacecraft and the spacecraft pass over the boat, pick up that signal. And then when they pass over the people on the land, they send that signal back down. And that lets us know where the boat is, that everything is OK. And so we can keep track of ships even when they're out on the ocean. And what that means is if something happens, like they're commandeered by pirates, for example, that beacon will get shut off. It's one of the first thing that happens when pirates take hold of a ship is they shut off that beacon because they don't want to be tracked. But if we know exactly where that ship is and we know exactly when that beacon got turned off because the spacecraft told us, we can alert the emergency services straight away and send people out to try and make sure that everything is OK with the people on board. So really, really simple, but a really great way that you, we can use space every day to try and keep people safe at sea. The second thing that I want to tell you is about how we can use spacecraft to help monitor animals on Earth. And this is really exciting to me because actually we couldn't do this about 10 years ago. This is only something we've been able to do in the last three or four years because satellites have gotten so powerful. So why would we want to monitor animals from space? Well, you might have heard about things like migration, the idea that animals move across the planet sometimes when, for example, it gets cold in the winter, they might move to a warmer part of the world. Um, and also, of course, you might have heard about endangered animals. So the fact that some animals we know are getting fewer and fewer. And so it's really helpful for us to be able to keep track of where the animals on our planet are and that they're healthy and that they're doing well. 
So what I'm going to do is show you some pictures from space of animals and see if you can guess what these animals are, because I think this is pretty cool. So this is the first picture. Uh, we can see some brown blobs that are sitting on a sandy island out in the middle of an ocean. Looks very nice to me. So again, turn to the person next to you. See maybe what do you think that animal might be? I'll just give you a couple of seconds to guess. And maybe this will help you out. These are walruses. I can't believe that we can see walruses from space. I think this is amazing. There is a whole project being run by researchers to try and track walruses from space. And they're actually asking people to log on and join in and count the walruses so we can know exactly how many there are. Okay, second animal for you to guess. So turn to the person next to you. I'll give you another five seconds. What's your best guess? Again, another hint, these are whales. These are whales, not in the bottom right, that's a boat, but in the top left, those are whales. I, if you look really closely, you can actually see their little tails, um, which again, I think is just amazing. And this has been really important for us to start to see how whales are living as the oceans warm up a little bit because of climate change and are they moving to different parts of the world? Okay, last one. This one's a bit of a tricky one. I'm gonna give you again another few seconds to guess. Maybe look at the environment we're seeing there. What kind of place in the world might that, that be? That might give you some hints. So again, another five seconds quickly. And another hint, it's penguins. Um, and actually I've cheated a little bit here because what we're not, what we're seeing is not actually penguins because penguins are a little bit too small to see from space. What we are seeing is penguin poop. Um, and so this is something researchers found back in 2015 that actually by taking photos from space, they could see where penguins were living because they could see all the penguin poop on the snow. Um, and this is really cool because we could take pictures of the same place a couple of years later and see there's no penguin poop. So we know now that that colony of penguins must have moved to another area and settled there. So again, it's a way that we can just keep track of these animals. If we're worried, we can send people in to investigate and see what's going on. Really quickly, there is a, a website that you can go on where you can actually see these images from space and these animals. So here is a really quick video. Uh, you can see there, those animals are actually hippos, um, a little bunch of hippos down by the river. Um, there's lots of different animals that you can see and you can click through this yourself. So I'm gonna put um, a little bit of information on the next slide that'll show you what you can Google to find this video for yourself or to find this, this uh, interface for yourself. So maybe you can do that um, and have a look at home because I think it is really, really cool. So that's the, the, the link. It, the link's a bit weird, so it's easy it's just to Google. So Google Earth animals from above and you can click through and see what animals you can spot from space. And that is open to absolutely everyone. So to finish off, those are just two, I think, really cool ways that we use satellite data to help people here on Earth every single day. And so my challenge to you at the end of today is to think about what would you do if you had your very own spacecraft? So we've just talked about a couple of things that we can see from space, a couple of things that we can do. Engineers today are coming up with new ideas all the time of how we can use all of this information from space to help people on Earth. But I am 100% sure that loads of you out there will have great ideas that we haven't thought of or tried yet. So that is my challenge to you, is to go away and think about based on what you know, maybe your everyday life, maybe something that's really important to you, what would you do if you could engineer your very own spacecraft? So that's my challenge. Thank you so much for listening to me. I hope that was interesting. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing all the questions that you have. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Kira. And I know when I was, um, when you gave me that sneak peek last week and I started seeing some of those bits, the animals from space looked fascinating. So we've got uh, 14 schools with us so far today, which is brilliant. 
and it's now over to you to ask questions. I obviously we've already got two in the chat, so we will start with those ones. Um, but please, if you've got a question you would like to ask Kira about her job, what she does about space, um, then please pop them into the Q&A or into the chat feed and we will start going through them. So I'm going to begin with a question from Holly. And they were right out of the blocks with this one. And they'd like to know, have you ever won an award for your work? <laughs> I have. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Holly. Um, yeah, so just this year, I won an award. I was uh, named as the IET, which is the Institution of Engineering and Technology. I was named as their Young Woman Engineer of the Year. Um, and that was so exciting. Um, there were six finalists nominated for three different categories. Um, and they were doing so many impressive things from developing, you know, smart wheelchairs to help people who maybe need help walking um, and people who are helping to design bridges to be more safe so that they're not going to fall down on us. Um, so there were so many women doing incredible things in engineering. But yeah, I, I won that award for my work. Um, and I think it was really exciting for me to be able to um, to talk about what I do as well, because I think people think that space is really far away. And actually, as we've just talked about, it touches all of our lives. So it's great to be able to, to have the opportunity to tell people about that. Brilliant. And the next question that's come from Mia. Um, do you dislike anything about your job? Do I dislike anything about my job? You know, I'm not sure that I do, actually. I really enjoy my job. One of the best things, I think, about being um, working in a university is that I get to do something different every day. So some days I'm doing my own research, I'm modeling spacecraft, or I'm working with companies to help them find satellite data that can help them. And then other days I'm teaching and working with students and they always have the best questions and the best ideas. So that's always really exciting as well. Um, I suppose the only thing maybe that I that I find a bit tiring about my job is that uh, one of the things we have to do is we have to try and get people to support the work that we're doing. So we have to talk to the government and to companies and tell them what's so important about what we're doing. And because, like I say, space is so far away, sometimes it's really hard to convince people just how important it is. But hopefully all of you today can go away and spread the words and help me out so that we can get some more support for that. Um, but no, I absolutely love my job. Brilliant. And the next question come from Emmy. They'd like to know, were you interested in space as a young child? Hi, Emmy. Uh, great question. So, yes, I was. Uh, I always say that um, it was my dad who took me out to, to see the stars. He loved astronomy um, and he used to take me out and show me the constellations and the planets when I was a kid. Um, and that really got me excited about space. Uh, so it was from there. But I never dreamed that I would actually be able to work in space because I thought it was something that you had to go to NASA to do. But actually, in the UK and in Europe, we have an amazing space industry. Um, at the University of Manchester, they've just built and launched their very first spacecraft. So we actually have a spacecraft in orbit at the moment. Um, there's somebody down the hall from me who is busy controlling that spacecraft and doing experiments on it. And that is just right here at home. So um, yeah, so if it's something that you're excited about, there is absolutely a job for you, I guarantee it. Perfect. And the next question that's come in is, what's your favorite thing about space? Oh, that's such a hard question. What is my favorite thing about space? I think actually, for all that I say that my work is all about looking down at Earth and how it can help people, because I think that's really exciting. Um, I think what's most exciting to me about space is the fact that we don't know everything about it yet. So obviously there's still lots of different planets and galaxies that we haven't been able to explore. But not only that, um, I think because we haven't sent that many spacecraft up, you know, we don't know yet what we can do from space and what we can do with all that data. So I think there's just so much more to be explored and to be learned. And I think that's really exciting. Brilliant. And Sam from Year Four's asked, the, the rocket that had your name engraved on it, where did it go to? 
That's a really great question, Sam. Thanks. Yeah, so that that was the spacecraft that we built in Scotland, and that went up to about 500 kilometers above our head, so about the same height as the space station, and it's circling around. It passes over the poles of the space of the Earth in a circle, and it's looking down at the Earth and taking images um, and sharing data with us down on the Earth. So it didn't go very far away. It didn't go to Mars or anything like that. That would have been pretty exciting exciting um but uh, it's still overhead looking down and sending some images back which is great brilliant and um, the next question's come from tamzin and um how do you it's quite a technical one this one i think it's how do you get a satellite into space that's a really great question, Tamsin. Um, the way that we get satellites into space is we use rockets. Um, and rockets are, <laughs> I think it's funny, we always say, you know, oh, it's not rocket science, like rocket science is really, really hard. Um, rockets at the simplest level are just big fireworks. Um, <laughs> although there's a bit more complicated going on behind the scenes. But basically they are big long tubes we put our spacecraft right at the top in a little container where they're safe. And then at the bottom, we have essentially explosives, rocket fuel that we set on fire um, and we send that rocket up into space. Um, what's really uh, hard is to make sure that it goes fast enough that we can get that spacecraft into the orbit that we want. So I said that the satellite, with my name on it, went to about 500 kilometers up. Um, and actually, the hardest bit is not getting that high. The hardest bit is going fast enough that it doesn't fall back down. So that satellite is traveling at about seven kilometers a second. So when you think about the fact that, you know, uh, a car maybe goes at 70 kilometers an hour, this is seven kilometers a second. That is very, very fast. So that's what most of the power in that rocket is doing. Um, something that's really exciting now in the UK is we're actually building rockets and rocket sites right here in the UK. And we're hoping to launch our first rocket from the UK this year um, and put a spacecraft into orbit from the UK. Uh, so you could, in the very near future, be able to see rocket launches right from here in the UK, which will be pretty exciting. That sounds really cool. I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, the next one from William. Um, they'd like to know, what is your favourite thing about your job and why? Oh, that's a tough question to try and, uh, try and answer, William. I think my favourite thing about my job is that because I work in a university and I do research, it means that I can pick the challenges that I think are most important and I can work on those. So whereas in a company, you're maybe working on a product or, or something to, to go, you might be building a spacecraft, for example, that somebody wants to do a specific task. I kind of look at what do I think the next big challenge is going to be in five or 10 years? And how can I help us solve that problem now? So it means I get to be really creative in my job. Um, and that to me is really exciting. And I get to try things um, like trying to help people fight piracy from space that, that maybe otherwise um, wouldn't be able to, to get done. So that's probably the most exciting part about my job. Brilliant. And Ruben's asking, have you been to space and seen the animals for yourself? That is an excellent question, Ruben. Very, very astute. I can see there's a skeptic here. Uh, no, I have not been to space myself. I would love to go to space myself, but no. Um, the thing is, it's really hard to put people in space. Um, we've got to send up all sorts of things to help them survive. We've got to make sure they can breathe. We've got to send clean air um, or recycle the air. We've got to send water and food. Um, so we have the space station up in space where we have about six people at any time. Um, but otherwise, it's, we don't really send people into space. And that's why we rely so much on these spacecraft, because they are our eyes in the sky, because we can't be up there doing it. It would be great if we could just send a zoologist who was an expert in walruses up into space and they could just, you know, have a look and tell us what's happening. Um, but it's just really, really hard and, and a little bit dangerous as well. Um, so we rely on our spacecraft, which are essentially robots. Um, and we put those robotic eyes up into space so that they can look down and tell us what's happening. 
Brilliant. I think that sort of leads a bit into Ivy's question and a few other questions that I can see in the chat feed at the moment as well, which I've not moved on to yet, but several people, including Ivy, are asking, would you like to go to space? I would absolutely love to go to space. I think it would be so, so exciting. Um, but I will say it's really hard. You know, you have to train for quite a few years to be an astronaut. Um, they normally look for people who have experience of maybe diving or doing things like that, that are quite challenging, you know, physical things and to me are quite scary. Um, and so actually there was a, a call a few years ago for ESA, the European Space Agency, who were looking for new astronauts um, to come in and be trained up to go to space. And I actually didn't put my name down because I thought all these things they're looking for experience in, I think I would be too scared to do, which makes me think maybe I would be too scared to, to go to space. So much and all as I would love to do it, I'm not sure that I'm the right person for the job. Also, most importantly, I get really, really travel sick on boats, on cars, on planes. And I'm sure no one would want to be on a rocket with me when I was feeling unwell. So <laughs> I'm really happy instead to be helping to support the space industry down here on Earth, because at the end of the day, it's all the engineers working hard who make sure that those people can go into space safely and do their jobs safely. And so I think if I can help there, that's good enough for me. Brilliant. Um, next question has come from Dylan, and they'd like to know, what's your favorite discovery that you've seen from space? That is a great question, Dylan. I think my favorite discovery uh, from my job, so something that I've actually physically worked on myself, was a project I did with the, uh, it was actually with a volunteer lifeboat group in the UK. So these were people who um, volunteered their time to work in a lifeboat. And when people were out sailing or fishing might get into trouble, this lifeboat would go out and help them. Um, and I helped them to find some satellite data for their job because the problem they had was that when they were going out in their boats to try and rescue people, sometimes they would run aground. So the water would get too shallow and they would crash into the sand and get stuck. And that happened because I guess you've seen the tides at the sea maybe go in and out. It moves the sand around. And so every time they went out, the sand was in a different place and they would crash into it. And that was dangerous for them. And it was dangerous for the person they were trying to rescue. And so we were able to get satellite images that showed them where the sand was really, really clearly. Um, and they could just print it out, laminate it and take it out in the boat with them so that they had a little map that they could carry around. And when they got called out, they could go and speed away. But the best part of the whole thing was that one day uh, they called me and they said, you know, can we get another image? So I sent them it. And that afternoon they got a call out because there was a group of whales trapped in the estuary. And what had happened is the whales had come in through the little channels and were having fun splashing around in the estuary. But as the tide got lower, they started to get stuck and they couldn't find their way back out because they kept meeting this sand and so the lifeboat crew used the map to see where the sand was and where the deep water was and they kind of went out and like herded the the whales and led them back out into the ocean and were able to save them so to me that was the most exciting thing that I could see from space that we quite literally were able to save whales um, just by looking at where some sand was brilliant oh, that sounds fantastic um, Amber and Finn have both asked very similar questions um, and they would like to know um, what other jobs are you interested in and what other jobs have you done other than the one you're currently doing? That's a really great question. So I've done a couple of jobs um, before I got into this job. So I was, during my undergraduate degree, I did lots of summer jobs. So I worked in different space companies I mentioned in five different countries. Um, and what I did in those jobs was I mostly uh, looked at how we design and actually build spacecraft. Um, and my particular job, which sounds really silly, but I promise you is really important, <laughs> was looking at how to keep the spacecraft from getting too hot or getting too cold. 
So um, when we're up in space or when the spacecraft is up in space, it has the sun shining directly on it about half the time. And then the other times it's going to be behind the Earth. So the Earth is between the satellite and the sun. And then it's going to be completely in shadow. Um, and so because of that, space is really cold. <laughs> there's not a lot up there to keep the satellite warm. You know, there's no protection like we have here on Earth with our atmosphere. And so the satellite can go, you know, down to like minus 150 degrees Celsius and all the way up to 200 degrees Celsius if we don't look after it. So my job was to work out essentially where we would put blankets on the spacecraft to try and keep various parts warm. Um, and where we would put little radiators on it that would let the heat escape out to space uh, so that we could cool it down when we needed to. Um, so that was a job that I did and I really enjoyed it. But uh, what I wanted to be able to do was see more about um, what those spacecraft were actually doing. And so I decided to go on and do a PhD. I studied um, astrodynamics, which is basically how spacecraft move, fancy word, how spacecraft move. Um, and that let me go into the job that I have now. Brilliant. And then the next question that's come in is a bit more linked to climate change in space. Do you monitor the impact that we're having from space and can you see it happening live? Yeah, so one of the most important things that the satellites in space are doing for us today is monitoring the different aspects of climate change. So there's lots of things we can see from space that we couldn't see easily on Earth. Um, some of the things we can see are, for example, uh, if we take pictures of the ice caps from maybe five years ago or three years ago, and then today, we can see if those ice caps are getting smaller because the ice caps are melting because of the heat. So that's one of the things that we can see. Other things that we can see is we can see how plants are growing in different parts of the world. We can see if maybe they're finding it harder to grow because the climate is getting drier um, and they're struggling you know, to find that water in the environment. So that's something else that we can see from space. Um, and one of the other things, which I am not an expert in, but there are very smart people looking at all of this, is that we can actually look at the atmosphere itself. So obviously the atmosphere is made of gas, so it's invisible to our eyes. But one of the things we can do from space is we can actually look at how light bends and how it reflects and what color the light is after it's passed through the atmosphere. Um, so that sounds really strange, but you can imagine on a really foggy day, that light doesn't look the same as it does on a normal day. And you also maybe have seen a sunset or a sunrise that the way the light is colored, we can get really brilliant reds and purples. So it's the same idea. We can see how that light changes as it passes through the atmosphere. And that can tell us about the amount of carbon dioxide and other gases that we know damage the planet. And we can start to measure those from space as well. Um, it's a really important part of our efforts to try and fight climate change because it means we can know when things are getting worse and when things are getting better. And like we heard during um, the lockdowns with COVID, things got a little bit better in some places and we could see that from space. So it's really important that we know what we're doing is having the effect that we want. Brilliant. I'm um, going to just flip from the Q&A just to a couple of the checks. I've seen a few schools that are just putting the questions in the chat. So I want to make sure we we get as many questions asked as we can do. Um, so um, P5B at Harry's Muir Primary have asked, um, there's two questions that I'm going to put together. So um, what inspired you to become an engineer? And P5A have asked, what inspired you to have a career in engineering? So very similar question from um, Harry's Muir's Ebb. So hopefully you can cover them together in uh, one answer, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned already that it was my dad who really encouraged me to study engineering. Um, but what really convinced me was that when I was in school, I had an opportunity to do um, like a work placement for a couple of weeks. And I actually went into a science lab. So I worked with some physicists, I worked with some chemists, and I worked with some biologists for a couple of weeks um, during my school time, when I was maybe 15. And one of the things I found was that while the science was really exciting, I missed knowing what happened next. 
So to give you an example, one of the things I had to do was I looked at water from a well in a, in a town in Ireland that they thought maybe was making people sick. And so we were measuring what was in the water to, to try and see were there, were there chemicals in it or heavy metals that might make people sick. And I took all the measurements and then sent them off to somebody else. And I said, well, what's going to happen? You know, are we going to do something? Is the well going to be closed? How do we fix this? And they said, oh, that's not our problem. That's someone else's problem. And I found that really uh, difficult to accept. I really wanted to know what happened next. How do we help these people? And the people who would go in and figure out how to fix the well, those were the engineers. So that was the distinction in my head was the difference between studying something and then getting to try and find the solution. So that was really the thing that made me decide, mm, no, I want to do the engineering bit, not the science bit. Brilliant. So the next question is going to come from a year two class before I'm going to go to St. Stephen's, who I know have been waiting patiently for some answers to their questions. Um, so the year two class would like to know, how long does it take to build a spacecraft? And can spacecraft be all over the world? That is a really excellent question. So back in the old, I say the old days, um, back maybe 20 years ago, before that, it would take a really long time to build a spacecraft. We would normally take like five or 10 years to plan it, and then five or 10 years to build it, and then another maybe five or 10 years to actually launch it and set it up and get it working. So maybe 30 years. So it could be someone's whole career before they get to see the spacecraft go into space. That's why one of the spacecraft I worked on is still being tested. I worked on it maybe nearly 10 years ago now, um, and it's still being, still sitting around waiting to go into space. But what's exciting now is that actually here in the UK, in fact, is, is one of the places it started, is we now build really small spacecraft, um, particularly things called CubeSats, which are about the size of a shoebox. And they are super quick to build. We can design, build, and launch them in less than a year. Um, and that's really exciting. And that's changed the way that we do things in space, which also kind of answers your second question about where we can put them. Because again, long ago, when it took so long and so much money to build these spacecraft, we didn't have all that many of them. But now we are building and launching hundreds and even thousands every year. So we actually have more than 3000 spacecraft in, in orbit around our Earth um, that are all working at the moment and doing different jobs. And they will be able to look at and see every part of the Earth. Um, so as they circle around the Earth, they pass over different parts of the Earth and the Earth turns underneath them. So they get to see every single bit of the globe. Um, so nobody's left out. Brilliant. So now we've got to St. Stephen's. Thank you for waiting patiently while we've got to some of your questions. But and, and the first question is always my favourite one when, uh, when we're talking about space. They'd like to know, what is your favourite planet? And do you think that we will eventually live in space? Oh, well, my favorite planet is Saturn. Um, and the reason Saturn is my favorite planet is because it's got rings and we can actually see them through a telescope from Earth. So um, it looks really, really beautiful uh, if you can get a good telescope and look up at the sky. Um, whereas all the other ones kind of look the same and I get them, you know, I might not be able to tell you which one it is, but Saturn, if you see it in a telescope, you can see the rings. So that's my favorite. Um, in terms of, do I think we will ever live in space? I don't know. I think there's so much exciting stuff going on at the moment with, um, you know, people going up into space as space tourists. Um, we've got all these plans to go back to the moon and to maybe go to Mars. I think someday we will have people living in space. In my head, I think that's probably going to take more than 100 years to happen. But I'm sure if you asked somebody 20 years ago, they would say it would take 100 years before we could build a shoebox sized spacecraft. So I wouldn't be surprised if I was wrong and you all uh, are you know, flying around in space before we know it. But I think it's going to take, take a bit longer than that. But I would uh, really like to be proven wrong. Brilliant. Um, the next question I've got is from Betty, but I think we've answered this one. So Betty also wanted to know the favourite thing about your job, but I know we've picked that one up already. So we'll move on to Bluebell's question. 
And we would like to know, did they use the satellites to know where the Titanic was? Did they use the satellites to know where the Titanic was? So this is going to test my knowledge of history, <laughs> but I think the Titanic was back in like the 80s or the 90s. Um, and these kind of satellites that we use now to monitor ships have only been launched in the past five years. Again, they're these little shoebox ones because we need to be able to put up so many so that we can see all of the ships that are all over the world at the same time. If we had one satellite up there, we'd have to wait for it to, to travel around and, and, you know, see every ship and pick up its little beacon. Um, and so uh, this is something that's actually only happening in the last couple of years when we can build these little, cheap, very quick to build spacecraft. And the next thing we're looking to do now is to track aircraft as well. So that's going to come in the future as well, which is really exciting. But great question. Brilliant. And the next one's from Abrima. How long have you been working with space? How long have I been working with space? So I worked on my first spacecraft in the second year of my university, which was when I was 19. So that is about 12 years ago now. Um, so yeah, so I've obviously studied as well, um, but pretty much every year since then, I've had a job somewhere working on spacecraft. So yeah, more than 10 years. That makes me feel old. <laughs> um, no, I think the next one we've got is, so Harry's Moore, we've got P5A and P5B on the on with us today. And uh, the questions that are coming from the classes are brilliant. So uh, they, they've got a question around, what's the most fascinating thing that you've seen from a satellite image? And have you ever seen anything that's strange or unusual from space? <laughs> That's a really great question. And actually, one of the things that I would recommend, if you can, is to go out and Google and see satellite imagery, because a lot of it is free, actually, from NASA and from the European Space Agency. And you can look at it yourself. You can look at your own house. Um, it's really exciting. A lot of the stuff on Google Earth is, is from space. So there's lots of it out there. What is the strangest thing that I have seen? Um, I would say probably one of the most exciting things that I think is um, you can see things like the Great Pyramids, um, you know, in Egypt. I would I, I love uh, Egyptian history. I think that's so exciting. I would love to go and see them for myself. But until then, you can see them from space. And I think that that's pretty exciting. Um, one of the other things that you can see, actually, um, which is, is quite interesting, um, is you can see... Um, you can see cities so you can see bridges you can make out buildings um you can see different places like that and and that's really interesting if you look at how how cities are built because some of them like in america are like a grid system and you can see them from above they look like a chessboard whereas in the uk things are a bit more crazy um and the other one I think that's uh, that's really exciting is you can see Mount Everest. I'm never going to climb Mount Everest, but you can see Mount Everest from space and all the snow on it. And, and I think that's pretty cool. Uh, strange things. I remember there was a story once where somebody spotted um, a strange pattern that someone had basically cut into their field. It was like a farmer's field and they cut in these really strange drawings of people and everyone thought, oh, maybe it's aliens, but it was just a farmer having a fun time with his lawnmower. So that was a bit of a strange one. <laughs> Brilliant. And then we've got uh, questions from Kyle and Joseph that I'm going to put together. So Kyle would like to know about the hardest thing with your job. And Joseph's asking whether or not you're glad you became an engineer. <laughs> so the hardest thing about my job, I think, is that space is a really challenging environment to work in. So if you can imagine um, when something breaks here on Earth, like your car breaks down, for example, you can take it to the garage and someone can fix it for you. They open it up and they look inside and, and they put things back together. Um, and, you know, even if it's a computer, we can normally, you know, hammer the power button until it shuts down or pull the plug and, and you know, figure it out. Um, in space, no one can go up and fix the spacecraft. So if something goes wrong, that's kind of 
a year of work or 30 years of work all gone to waste. So the hardest thing about my job is that when we try and plan these space missions, we have to be really, really careful about how we design them to make sure they're going to do exactly what we want them to do and that they're going to do that reliably and not break. So um, it's it's kind of hard work to, to work all that detail out and make sure that you're 100% sure that your maths is right that you've done your calculations right and that it's going to work um, uh, the way that you want it to do. Am I glad I became an engineer? Absolutely, 100% would not change uh, a thing. I absolutely love what I do. Um, and I think what's really exciting, especially now, is how quickly technology is changing. So it's never boring. There's always new, exciting things happening. Um, and it's brilliant to be able to be a part of that. Brilliant. And the next two questions, they're going to come from Tom and from Anas, and they are, again, two, two probably linked questions. So Tom started by asking, what was your very first discovery? And then Anas's follow on is, how many things in total have you discovered? <laughs> wow. So discovered is kind of a, that's, that's a big word. I'm not sure that I'm quite on the, I've never discovered like pyramids or, or anything like that. Um, but I would say there's different projects that I've worked on maybe is a better way to think about it. Um, and different things that I've found out through my work. So let's put it like that. Uh, the first thing that I worked on in my job was actually I worked on how to move spacecraft when they're already in space. So this isn't something we really do if we can avoid it because we don't want the spacecraft to crash into another spacecraft. Um, and also when we send the spacecraft off, it only has a certain amount of fuel on board. So we don't really want to be driving it around here, there and everywhere because it'll run out of fuel really quickly. But what I was looking at was whether when we had things like forest fires happening and we really needed to know what was going on really quickly, how we could steer our spacecraft so that we could get a really good image of that fire um, straight away. So the first thing that I discovered, if you want, is that actually sometimes spacecraft are really annoyingly, even though we've got 3000 of them, sometimes they're just in the wrong place for what we need them to do. Um, but what I discovered was that we can actually drive spacecraft to make them fly over something that's really important, like a fire, um, and take the images where we want them. Um, and actually, we're hoping we're going to try and test that in orbit in the next couple of years. Um, and the next question was how many or many things in total have you discovered? But I think you've, you've probably covered that one with the answer too. I think so. Yeah. And um, and Harper Rose, you also, without even knowing it, you've answered Harper Rose's question because they asked how many satellites are currently orbiting the Earth. And I think you said about 3,000. About 3,000. Yeah. Brilliant. So Xander has then asked, have any of the satellites ever been hit by asteroids? And Charlie would like to know about the furthest satellite that you've launched. Sure. OK, so. I'll do those the other way around. So the furthest satellite that I've launched is actually that there none of them are very far. They're all ones that look down at our Earth. So they're all going up to about 500 kilometers, 1000 kilometers above the Earth, which sounds like a long way. But when we have some that go all the way out to 36 thousand kilometers to look back at earth um actually a thousand kilometers isn't that far away in the scheme of things if you think about you know how big the earth is a thousand kilometers is actually you know it's it's not that far across the earth or anything it's not like one time around the earth so it's not that far um so that was that and the other question was i'm sorry i'm losing <laughs> my mind oh no no don't worry the um the other question was about us um Asteroids hitting satellites. Yes, asteroids hitting satellites. Excellent question. Yes, asteroids hit satellites all the time. Fortunately, they're normally really, really tiny. Most of the kind of asteroids and, and meteors that we see flying around the Earth are very, very tiny. Um, so normally what happens is they, uh, they just hit the solar array, normally because that's the biggest bit of the spacecraft, and they just pass through and head on their way. Um, and we build satellites so that they won't be broken if that happens, that it might just turn off a little bit of the solar array, but the rest of it can keep working. Occasionally, 
there's a good, you know, occasionally satellites randomly stop working and we don't always know why because we can't send someone up to go and look at it and see if there's a hole in the side. So sometimes we think these asteroids hit the center of a spacecraft and that might break the computer, for example, and do some damage. Um, but it, it doesn't happen all that often, fortunately. But yes, they do get hit all the time, but normally not a problem. Brilliant. Um, we've answered Edward's question, um, which was what size of the spaceships? And you've been talking about the size of shoeboxes with some of these cube satellites. Um, so there's just three more questions. Um, so the first one that we'll, we'll do is Emily Rose, um, who's asked, do you know of any satellites that have gone too close to the sun? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, so actually, one of my colleagues and friends worked on a satellite that was being sent out to the sun. Um, I don't think it's gone yet. It's called Bepi Colombo. Um, but it's going to go really close to the sun to try and take pictures of it. Um, and what they have to do is they have to design a special shield so that the satellite can hide behind this shield. And then it has a little box that like a little window that it opens so it can take a picture really quickly and then closes its window so that it doesn't get damaged. Um, so again, engineers are really careful about planning these things so that we know we're gonna go close to the sun. So we're really careful to make sure that everything that, that needs to be protected is protected. Um, and people like me and my colleagues who plan missions, we make sure that if you're ever going to pass close to the sun, we give it a, a wide berth so that we're not going to accidentally fly into it. So I don't know of any missions that have failed because of that, but it's definitely something you have to be careful of. Brilliant. And then we'll put these last two questions together because I think they're really interesting questions for us to finish on. So Bella's first question is, do you believe in aliens? And then Archie would like to know, where is the most exciting place that you've worked in your career? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll start with the most exciting place. So the most exciting place that I have worked in my career was uh, I did a summer uh, internship at the European Space Agency in the Netherlands. Um, and that was amazing because there was a group of us who were all students who were there working on different projects. Um, and at the same time, they were building spacecraft right down the hall from our offices and we could go in and take a peek on our lunch and see what was going on. Um, we had astronauts over to visit to talk to us about their experiences. Um, and there was just so much going on that we could all be involved in. So that was definitely the most exciting place to work. Um, they also had a big hall on site where they had like loads of old pieces and copies of satellites. You could go and look at them, um, walk around and sort of model parts of the space station. So that was the coolest place. Uh, if you ever get to visit, it's really, really cool. Um, do I believe in aliens? Yes, I, I, I do, but not in the, in the coming down and, and leaving crop marks sense, but I, I would like to believe that there has to be someone else out there in the big expanse of space. Um, probably not in our solar system, probably not on Mars, probably not on Saturn, um, but maybe out in, in some of the other planets that we've discovered around different stars. I think there's so much strange life on Earth, especially in our oceans. You know, there's things like jellyfish. I think jellyfish are crazy. Um, so when we can have that many strange animals living on Earth, I don't see why we couldn't have completely bonkers aliens living out on different planets out in space. So I absolutely believe there must be something out there. Uh, I just hope we get to discover it in my lifetime. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that, Kira. I know I have learned a lot listening to you uh, this morning. It has been fantastic. And as we've sat here speaking, we've also had another school's entries have landed with us here at our office too. So make sure as soon as your entries are ready, you get them into us because we're getting engineers to start grading them from today. The first batch leaves us today to go and be seen by engineers to judge ideas that have come up with from schools all across the UK. Don't forget you can join us again this afternoon at half past one, where we will be at, with Dr. Huda Morgan, who brings some of these ideas to life. And she'll be talking through how she goes about that process of taking an idea that you may come up with in your class and make it something that is really happening in, in front of us and, and does what you want it to do. So. Um, from myself, from the team here, thank you very much to everybody who's joined us. Kira, thank you so much for giving up your time this morning and inspiring the schools who've been with us. 
and we'll catch up with you all again soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. <laughs>